Uh, a few years ago, uh, when we'd moved to Wee War, I did a brief survey uh, with the Christians that we met with throughout the week on a Sunday during Bible study groups, and I asked them to describe the Christian life. Uh, they offered a number of words and a number of descriptions, but they basically fell into one of two groups. Uh, on the one hand, a number of people said the Christian life is incredibly hard and frustrating. And a whole lot of people in this church said, Amen to that, I agree. A number of other people said, The Christian life is wonderfully hopeful and delightful. And a number of people in the church said, Amen to that too. That's a strange tension, isn't it? But I actually think it reflects the experience of most Christians. Being a Christian is amazingly hard and wonderfully hopeful. Uh, Bringing a Christian on some days can be the definition of life is fine and then on other days can show how frustrating life really is. Being a Christian can involve a whole lot of rejection but it can be incredibly rewarding. Being a Christian can be unbelievably difficult And there are some days where there are words that can't describe the delight. We could go on, couldn't we? Most of us know that tension, don't we? And it's a really strange tension given what we heard last week, that Jesus is the king of the universe, that he's lived the life we couldn't live to die the death we all deserved and rose from the dead to say your judgment is paid, that if you're connected to him by faith, All your sins are forgiven and God has already set the table for you in heaven. So why is life so hard if God has fulfilled all his promises? Why is life so difficult? Why is life so draining? Well, the answer, I think, and we're going to look at that today, lies in understanding our times, not from my perspective, but from God's and the way in which that's the next step in God's unfolding plan. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, It's been a delight over the weekend uh, for many of us to sit in different places with different members of your people, gathered to hear your word and to commission people in leadership. Father, it's a reminder of how your people are gathered from every tribe, nation and tongue and how they meet in different buildings and in different towns and in different locations. Father, we come today with many differences, different concerns from the week that's been and different worries for the week ahead, with different delights and different hardships. But we gather with one thing in common, that Jesus has lived, died and risen for our sins and gathered us as your people. We give you thanks for this. Help us to understand what that means in this day and age. Amen. Well, we've been going through God's big picture, and as I said in the West, if you're in an art gallery and you're looking at a big picture, uh, we started right on the left-hand side and we're nearly at the right-hand border. We've just worked our way along and we've looked at the picture and the progress. Uh, We've looked at the pattern, God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. We've seen how that was created perfect and then we've gone into the depths of Adam and Eve's rejection of God and then we've seen God's commitment in the promise to Abram. We've seen the partial fulfilment in the land of Israel as God's people gather around the temple and they have rest under Solomon. We've seen what happens as that falls away into exile and God uses the prophets to call his people back. We've seen the goodness of the fulfilment of that last week in Jesus Christ, and today we're moving forward as we think about what that means now. And the place I want to start, and we're at point two on the outline, so those members of our church, I'm not going to call you kids because you're not, uh, you've got a blue folder and you're following along some of these questions. We're at question one, and we need to be listening to some of the answers that are there. But listen to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 19, because I think this gives us our starting point. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation 
for God's sons to be revealed. A bloke called Paul wrote that. Uh, He's a follower of Jesus. He's writing to a whole bunch of other followers of Jesus who live in the greatest city of the known world, in the city of Rome. And his letter deals with all the stuff we face today. This part in particular deals with what it means to live at this time. And I hope you notice that Paul identified two time periods there. Uh, You would have seen uh, Ben and Baxter holding them up. Drinda talked about them uh, in her kids' talk. There's the present time and then there's the future time. Uh, The present time, uh, look there at the verse, uh, it's connected with sufferings. Uh, The future time is connected with eager anticipation for something amazing to be revealed. Uh, Someone far cleverer than me has summarised it like this. It's now, but not yet. Now, but not yet. Uh, That's pretty simple to remember because it's only four syllables, isn't it? Now, but not yet. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, now there is this great truth. The great truth that God has fulfilled his promise to the family of Abraham and all humans that through Abraham's family he would roll back curse and bring blessing. He did that in a bloke called Jesus Christ who lived, died and rose so that our sins could be paid for and we could be reconciled to God. That's the great truth now. Jesus is God's people, he's God's place, he's God's blessing. And if you are connected to him by taking God at his word, you are in God's people, you are already in God's place, and you have all the abundance of God's blessing. But today when I woke up, my knees were sore, my relatives are sick, There is a virus running around the world that no one can stop. There is civil war. There is the aftermath of bushfire and drought. What's going on? Well, that's the not yet. Now that message about Jesus is true, but not yet do we see it in all its consummation, in all its bigness, in all its perfection. We still live in a world that's broken by human rebellion, that's affected by human sin. We still live in relationships that struggle with selfish desire. We still visit people in hospital and there will be funerals in the weeks ahead. Now Jesus has beaten sin for us. Not yet are we living perfect lives in heaven. Now God has made us part of his household in Jesus. Not yet are we living in God's house in the room that Jesus has prepared. Now the devil is beaten and all of our sins are forgiven. Not yet do we look God in the eye. Now when you chop the head off a snake, it is dead. Not yet do you touch the head because you can still be bitten. That's the world we live in. The great truth is the devil is now beaten, beheaded, disempowered because in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, God has judged our sin. The devil is not our boss, but he keeps thrashing around wanting to bite us, doesn't he? And we feel that every day, not yet. Are we dwelling in all the wonder of the perfection of God's kingdom? And so we live in this overlap time. We are now God's people. Not yet do we live in God's house. Ah, Thank you, Bernard, for that simple explanation of four syllables. But just raise a whole lot of questions for me. I hope it does. You'll see some of them there on your outline. It's always raised questions for people and for God's people. Jesus goes up into heaven and gives the disciples a full plate of responsibilities in Acts 1 and they immediately start asking questions. How is this possible? When one of those disciples, Peter, writes two letters and we heard from one today, he actually acknowledges that people are scoffing at God already, saying he cannot do what he promised. 
and say there are questions that need answering. I've limited them to four. You'll see them there on your outline. Uh, so those of our members who are filling out that sheet, we're on the next one. Uh, the first one's the most obvious one. The first one's the most obvious one. Uh, why is God delaying? Why is God delaying? I mean, if God is in charge and if Jesus has beaten sin, why not just end it all now? That would be the simplest thing to do. That's what I would do. Does that mean that God can't be trusted to keep his promises? Now, let me just remind you, over the last nine weeks, we've seen that God has a reasonable track record in keeping promises, doesn't he? It's kind of in the 100 percentile range. Whatever he promises, he does. So the issue isn't with God's track record. The issue has to do with the nature of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like 1,000 years and 1,000 years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The issue isn't God's ability. The issue isn't, look, God's mislaid his promises. The issue isn't we can't trust God. The issue is how patient is God? He wants all of his people to meet Jesus and he's waiting for those citizens to take up the offer of citizenship. God will end things one day. Nothing is more certain. But the timing of that day is for God to know. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will, be, will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. In fact, listen to Jesus as he describes his understanding. Again, this is Jesus in Mark 13, verse 32. Now concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father. Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. That's Jesus saying that the end is in God's hands. So God's not delaying because he's inept. God's not delaying because he's incapable. God's not delaying because he's untrustworthy. God's delaying because he's patient. That raises a second question for me because I think I'm a pretty typical kind of guy. I don't like sitting still. I don't like waiting. I like to be doing something. I want to be active. I want to be occupied. I I can't sit still. So if I'm part of God's household, what should I be doing now? Well, the first part of the answer is actually pretty personal. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, if you've got that open, let me read to you the first part of that answer. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, It's clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. Did you get that? As an individual, how do you wait? How do you occupy your time? You grow in the image of the father of the household. You grow in godliness. You reflect God to the world, which, if you remember, is what God's people have always had to do, isn't it? In that reading that Mary brought us from 1 Peter 2, you're to reflect God to the world, to declare his praises, the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that's also the job of the people of God, the way they live together, the way they do stuff together, the way they focus If you listen to Mark chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus makes it very clear. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. 
That's a really important verse. You see, Mark 13 is a passage a lot of people go to to work out when the end of the world's coming. Jesus describes what he understands to be the end of all things. And it's really important that when you read it, he only gives one command. He doesn't tell you to stock up your pantries. He doesn't tell you to work out the date so you can mark it on your calendar. He gives one command. He tells his people that the good news must be proclaimed to all the world. That all the world is to meet Jesus. That people from every tribe, every language, every nation and every tongue are to meet Jesus. So as God's people are remade in the family likeness, they are making sure that everyone meets Jesus and so are forgiven and reconciled to God. Now, if you pause and have a think about that, that's a fairly full plate God's given us, isn't it? I mean, think about those early disciples. There's 11 of them. They've just had to deal with the fact that the might of Rome and the might of the Jewish nation has just killed their Lord. He's risen from the dead and they're dealing with that fact and he's about to go up and he's left them with, go and tell all the world about me as you get remade in the family likeness. That's a big job, isn't it? A full plate. Now, I could deal with most full plates that are put in front of me, but that one, that one's massive, isn't it? So how am I going to do that job? How is that possible? Well, listen to these words that Luke records as Jesus leaves in Luke 24, 46. He also said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah would suffer, rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Jesus knows the serving he's given us, doesn't he? He knows how big that is. And so he says very clearly there, I'm going to send you some help. In fact, I'm going to send you what my father, your father, has always promised to give you. Who's that? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God himself come to hang with his people as they deal with the full plate in front of them. The Holy Spirit's going to do a number of jobs. John 15 to 16, talk about those jobs. He's going to remind you of the job. He's going to give you the words to say. He's going to remind the world of who Jesus is. He's going to work with sandpaper hard and soft to remake you in the image of God. He's going to intervene constantly. We're told in Romans 8.26 that the Spirit will join us in our weakness. That's true, isn't it? So we've got a helper who will enable us to deal with that full plate. Now, I don't think I grasp how big that is. That God has said, I will be with you until the end of all things, until every element is burnt up so you can do this job. I will dwell with you, in you. I will be around you until everything has been finished. Isn't that remarkable? And so the job that God has set us to be remade by him in his image as we tell people about Jesus can be done because God himself is going to do it through us. So what's happened to those promises of God? That's the last question because we've been looking at them, haven't we? The promises of God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Well, Neil made that clear, didn't he, last week as he opened the Bible, as he looked at what God had promised and fulfilled. It's fulfilled where? It's fulfilled in Jesus, isn't it? So let me be very clear. You are not the Messiah. You cannot rescue the world. You will not fulfill the promises of God. And neither will those ministers put in charge of you. There is one place they're all fulfilled, aren't they? 
they're fulfilled in Jesus. As you heard last week, Jesus is the people of God. Jesus is the place of God. Jesus brings the rule and blessing of God in himself. So if you are connected to him by faith, you're in that, in Christ, as the book of Ephesians talked to us last week. So by faith you are made part of the people of God from every nation, from every language, from every tribe, from every corner of the world gathered together as God's people. If you are connected to Jesus by trusting in what he's done, then you can look God in the eye. You have access to the one who made all things, who judges all sin, who saves by his will alone. That's remarkable, isn't it? Moses could only look at the back of God's head. We can look him in the eye. We can approach him. And when people come to meet God's people, wherever they are gathered, under whatever label they are gathered, they will meet who? They'll meet Jesus. As they point people to what God has done. Which means that when they meet God's people, wherever they are gathered, under whatever label they are gathered, when they meet the people of God connected to Jesus by faith, they'll see the rule and approval of God in real time and space, won't they? In the way this mob relates, in the way God's mob, wherever they gather, relate. They'll see grace, giving people what they don't deserve. They'll see patient love, where we deal with each other in sacrifice. They'll see the way that God has dealt with us in Jesus himself and they'll meet Jesus as we point people to him. So what are we to do with that? I'm at the last point on the outline, the last point on the sheet that those people with the blue folders got. Let me close with four brief suggestions. We need to recognise the reality of our times. One of the things that struck me over the summer holidays is that many in our world don't recognise the reality of our times, do they? Let me say that no amount of legislation will restore the environment. Let me say that no amount of education will change the human heart. Let me say that no amount of medical intervention will stop an unstoppable virus. The world is on a movement, isn't it? It has been since the Garden of Eden. It's on a movement to God creating everything new. Who will restore the world? It won't be me. It won't be our political system. It won't be our education system. It won't be our medical system. It will be God alone, won't it? He will restore the world. He's already shown us that, hasn't he, in that brief glimpse at the body of Jesus resurrected, hasn't he? That's the glimpse of the restored world in what Jesus has done. So please recognise the reality of our times. Uh, that will fill you with hope when you turn the news on, won't it? We will actually get somewhere. It will also fill you with answers to give the world around us as it is inevitably disappointed by human action and point them to the one who never fails. Secondly, please take up the commanded task. Uh, I had the delight of teaching one year of kindergarten scripture at Weevil. It was great. I loved it. I love kindergarten scripture because it's kind of like me. I deal with simple commands one at a time. That's like kindergarten scripture. You can't give them five commands one at a time. That's what we've received today, isn't it? One command. Be remade in the family likeness as you introduce people to Jesus. That's our job. That's the job we've been left with. Be remade in the family likeness as you introduce people to Jesus. Which people? 
all people. Let me be very blunt. Leave the discrimination to God. Our job is to introduce everyone to Jesus because that's what we're commanded to do. Give thanks to God. The promises of God have been fulfilled, haven't they? Just meet Jesus. There is God's people. There is God's place. There is God's blessing. There is God's rule. Give thanks to God that he does exactly as he says. I'll struggle to keep promises I make this morning by the time the day ends. God keeps promises he made before I was born, before the world was made. Give thanks to God for that and thank him for the help that he's given us. He hasn't neglected us. He knows exactly what our world is like. Did you, did you pick that up? As Paul talks about our world, God knows what it's like. He knows that it creaks and groans under brokenness. But there is a glorious future coming and he gives us the help we need. Which leads me to our last point. Please wait eagerly. I remember as a teenager that I certainly didn't want God to come back. I had so much to do with my life. I mean, imagine thinking that Jesus coming back could sit behind getting a uni education, getting a job, getting married, enjoying being a parent. Imagine putting Jesus' return at number five on the list. I I want Jesus to come back before I finish this sentence. Wouldn't that be marvellous? Wouldn't it be marvellous to listen to what Paul has said and to think about that? For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Next week we'll see what that day is like. But let me just give you a taste. On that day, we won't look at the back of God's head, we'll look him in the eye. On that day, we will walk into the presence of God shoulder to shoulder with men, women and children of every skin colour, from every age, in every tongue and language, from every nation, education and family background. And we will stand in the presence of God and look him in the eye and know him fully and sing his praises eternally and be restored. What else could you eagerly await for? What else could you tell to the world? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you that you know our times, help us to understand them. Father, thank you that you've given us a job which you will work through us. Help us to do it. Father, thank you that you've given us a glorious image of what will be. Help us to live now as your people and introduce others to Jesus. Amen.